is a mixture of various sections. So like I said, we're going to move through these different sections. We'll have quizzes in each section, um, and then a, a final quiz at the end. So this topic is cells, or cellular life, you might call it. And you guys know, you told me in our question today that cells are the basic unit of life, that they make up all living organisms. And you're correct. Scientists didn't really understand this, though, until you know the 17, middle of 17, late 1700s. How come? Why did it take that long for scientists to first really start to learn about cells? Scientists didn't really know about cells until then. Kendall? Yes. Yes. What they are? What? What's the term we use? Yeah, they are microscopic. They're very small. And so until microscopes were developed and lenses starting in the 1700s, 1800s, people weren't able to observe cells very well. And so it wasn't until microscopes started to be used that scientists started to really study cells. Okay? So that's why in our unit, we're going to start by learning about microscopes, learning how to use microscopes in the different types, practice, and then we'll actually use them to look at cells. So you have some vocabulary in your notes, you can refer back to it at different times throughout this unit. But for today, we're just going to get started a little bit on microscopes. And in class, we will be using two different types of microscopes. And we're going to just mention a third one today. So this is the type of microscope that we use most frequently in class. This is called a compound light microscope. Okay. Compound light microscope. Did you guys use microscopes like this in elementary school? No. Yes. Oh, some people did, some did not? Okay. So this is, um, this is the model we use. There's lots of types of compound microscopes, different brands, and they have different features and so forth. This is the one you'll mostly use. And this mic all microscopes, their purpose really is to magnify an image, to make something larger so that you can see it. These compound microscopes that we use can magnify an image from 40 to 400 times. We usually say X, 40X to 400X. Which means if I have this on low power and I'm looking through the microscope, what I see is actually 40 times larger than its actual size. Or if I switch to high power, I could bring that up to what I'm seeing in the microscope is 400 times larger than the actual size. So we can switch magnifications, we use magnifications based on what we're trying to see in our samples. So this is a compound light microscope. And we'll talk more about this one. This is the one you'll have a quiz about its parts and so forth. But we'll talk more about it in a little while. The second type of microscope that we will also use is this type of microscope. Now what do you notice is a big difference between that microscope and this? It's bigger where? What way? Okay, what else? Do you notice? Know? Soraya? There's more space There's more space here? Yeah? Abby? It's a shape differently. Different shape? Kendall? It looks older. Looks older, Gavin. Like yeah, back here, this post. Yeah. The other thing that we pick up on is the eyepieces. What about them? I think they're bigger. There's two. There's two. We would call this maybe a binocular microscope, a stereoscope. Uh, we also call it a dissecting microscope. Kind of is sometimes used in dissecting things. And it does have two eyepieces which gives it some features that are not found in the compound microscope. And this dissecting microscope, it doesn't magnify as much. The dissecting microscope magnifies between 10 and 40 times. But we'll talk about the advantage of that microscope in just a second. And then, do you have a question? No, we actually don't use a microscope for dissecting a frog. You could, but we won't. Um, 
The last type of microscope is one we don't have here in school. It's a complex microscope. It's more, almost more of a computer than it is a microscope. And this is called the electron microscope. <clears throat> it doesn't use light. It uses a beam of electrons rather than light to make an image. So you have to view it on a computer screen. And electron microscopes are very large, expensive. They might probably take up the top of this desk. That's how big the microscope itself would be. You have to treat your samples in a certain way and coat them in metal. And, um, they're very expensive. But they can produce magnification up to a million times. So they can give an extreme level of magnification and resolution. Um, but they are expensive. So I'll show you later today some images from the electron microscope. Like I said, we don't have one that we can actually use in class. So let's look at some images from these different microscopes. So for the compound microscope, when you use it, you uh, turn it on and you put what you're going to view on this flat part called this stage. And then you can look at it. Usually what we're putting on the compound microscope are things that are mounted on slides. A slide is this little rectangular piece of glass. This is a slide that already has something in it, glued there. So that, this has a paramecium sample view there. It's a little type of single-celled organism. Other times, we might make our own slides. Here is a blank slide with nothing on it. I could take a sample of water from that aquarium and place it on here, cover it with a cover slip, and view it. So we can make our own slides, or we can use prepared slides. And when we put our slide on the stage and look at it, okay, the light comes from under here, this light source. And then it goes through a hole in the stage, through our specimen, into this lens, up into the top part of the microscope. It gets reflected by a mirror and then out through the eyepiece for you to look at. Now, do you think, would I be able to look at my hand through this microscope? Yeah. Do you think this no. would work? No. Why wouldn't it work? James? Because the light doesn't go through. Yeah, it's too it's thick. Black. Any object we want to look at in the compound microscope, it has to be thin enough that light can pass through it. So really, in a microscope, the compound microscope, we only look at very, very thin objects, like a single-celled organism. Or if we want to look at, for example, some muscle cell, we might slice some muscle tissue very thin so light can go through it. So that's one of the downsides of the compound microscope. Whatever you're looking at has to be very, very thin. And so you're only seeing basically two-dimensional when you're looking in the compound microscope. So here are some images. That's this amoeba, or this paramecium I'll show you. That's what it would look like under this microscope. These are all single-celled living things. They're all types of protists that we'll be studying later on in the year. And these are all images through the compound microscope. But you notice everything looks pretty flat, but it allows us to see these organisms that otherwise would be too small to see. So that's what things look like under the compound microscope. The dissecting microscope works a little differently. So. When I put my hand on the dissecting microscope, would I be able to see my hand? Yes. What's different about this? Ariana? The top. Yeah, the light comes from the top, bounces off of my hand, and then goes through the lenses and out the eyepiece. So with this dissecting microscope, you could look at a thick object. Okay, you could look at your hand, you could look at you know, this remote, you could look at whatever you wanted really that fits under here with the dissecting microscope because it uses reflected light. And that gives it an advantage. Now what was the other thing I said about this that makes it much different? Gavin? It only has it, it magnifies less, yes. What else? It has two eyepieces and that is also important because two eyepieces 
allows you to get a three-dimensional view of whatever you're looking at. I'm going to take a little side trip here. Do you guys know how three-dimensional vision works? Like, we see very well three-dimensionally. I can tell that um, Abby and James are here close, and Connor's far away, and behind him is a window. Humans have very good what we call depth perception, okay? that we can tell how near or how far something is. And it's because of the arrangement of our eyes. Because both of our eyes are in the front of our face and both face forward, that allows us to have good depth perception. Did anyone ever use one of those virtual reality goggles? Yes. Or anyone ever use like Google Cardboard? You can put a phone in it. You've used it before, Connor? And what does it look like when you do that? Yeah, it's like a three-dimensional view. Um, or if you go to a 3D movie, or if you have a 3D TV in your house, the way all of those technologies work is by showing each of your eyes a different image. Put your hand, put your finger in front of your face, close. You probably all have done this, I used to do this as a kid. And open and close like alternating eyes. What happens to your finger? It seems to move. Now what happens if you hold it far away and do the same? It still moves, right? How much? Not as much. And if you look all the way across the room at something, it hardly moves at all. So the reason if you hold your finger close to your face, why does it move so much? Well, my left eye is looking at my finger sort of at this angle. And so it looks like it's here. When I switch eyes, my right eye is seeing it sort of almost straight on. So it looks like it's in a different position. And what happens is, in our brains, our brains are getting both images from both eyes. And if our brain looks at, notices, this object, our right eye is seeing it here, our left eye is seeing it somewhere different, what our brain does is it says, well, that object must be close to us because both eyes are seeing it very differently. If your brain takes your images from both eyes and they both look about the same, your brain says, well, that object must be far away. And so having two forward-facing eyes is what gives us depth perception. If you try to like play catch, if you, uh, we go outside today, I don't know if we are training, but next time you're outside playing catch or something, try and play catch with one eye open and one eye closed. It's really hard because you're taking away a large part of your depth perception. Okay? You can't see near the distance very well if you're just using one eye. I have a question. Yes. So like my grandma has like a glass eye because she has brain surgery and yep. she only has one eye. Yes. But she is like perfectly fine. How come? Well, she could probably see everything fine because you could see all the images fine with one eye, but she probably does not have good depth perception, seeing how close or how far, or it's more difficult to sense how near or how far something is because you don't have that extra information coming from the other eye. Will your brain like get a little bit, but it can never make up because you're still only seeing one flat image. So you probably learn to accommodate it a little bit, but you're still not going to have as good depth perception. So this microscope having two eyepieces allows us to have good depth perception with it and see three-dimensional objects. Here are some images. So an aphid, an insect. You can see it's three-dimensional. I can, I can see that. This is a planaria. It's a flatworm. We'll look at these later in the year. Here's a seed germinating. And again, this shows kind of a much more three-dimensional view than what we saw with the compound microscope. And then our third type of microscope, the electron microscope. Electron microscopes gives us great magnification, excellent resolution, but the objects we're looking at, usually we have to coat them with a thin coat of reflective metal and they can't survive that. So if we're looking at a living organism, it has to be dead to observe it. Here are some images from an electron microscope. Often you'll see these are gray images, but sometimes they're artificially colored by people. So when you see a few of these that have color, that's not the actual color of the objects. So it's a spider. That's toilet paper. They seem smooth, it's a super rough surface. 
That is Velcro. Oh, that's cool. Do you know what another, so do you know the generic name for Velcro is? Like Velcro is a brand name. It's like Kleenex. It's a type of hook and loop fastener. And the way that Velcro works, you know like the scratchy side of the Velcro? That is a bunch of little plastic hooks. The soft side of the Velcro is sort of these loops of plastic. And when you press it together, the hooks grab onto the loops and it stays closed. When you pull on it, those hooks are kind of flexible. They kind of bend and then eventually release and you can open it back up. Okay. Um, and so Velcro was invented by somebody that observed um, under the microscope burdocks. You know those little things that get on you go in the woods and they get in your hair or in your jacket? Yeah, those have the same sort of thing. The edge of those, they stick to all your clothes because they have these, these hooks at the end that grasp onto any loose surface. Okay. This is a human hair under the electron microscope. That's huge. This is the foot of a fly. This is one of those artificially oh, colored the, yeah. images. And they have all these tiny little sort of hairs which adhere to a surface that so it allows them to walk or go on the ceiling upside down and not fall off. Now this is the fly, these are the eyes of the fly, but on top of the fly are these parasitic insects called mites. So each of these little things look like aliens, those are actually parasites. Right. Here's another one, living on a beetle. The green part is the mite. Oh, 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 it's a maggot. Oh, of a compound microscope. And then tomorrow we're going to actually start to use these microscopes. So this is a compound microscope. This is a diagram of one. This looks slightly different from this, and I'll explain some of those differences in a minute. But you're going to have to know all the parts of the microscope and what they do. So to begin, this part you look through, what do you think it's called? Eyepiece. It's called the eyepiece. Change the question. I have a plastic version of the one on Yeah, a lot of times they sell these like a toy store or something. And I don't know if you ever had one, you know, sometimes they don't work all that great. You know, it sounds awesome, but a lot of times they're not. They don't, they don't give a great image and the lenses are sort of plastic. And, you know, you could sometimes see some cool things, but. Mine um, broke and then I, like the light broke. Yeah. You can't put the batteries in, so I got a flashlight and I did it and it worked, and I got to see the one that's like glued in it. it oh, yeah. Was, it actually worked. It yeah. was cool. Ariana? Um, what I was realizing with the blue one, uh -huh. like, they had the little insects on the sides. Oh, yeah? Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool to see things in the microscope. Everyone always loves it. Um, all right, so we have the eyepiece, which has a lens in it, which magnifies our image. But in a compound microscope, the image gets magnified twice. Once by this eyepiece lens, and then once by these lenses down here. These are called the objective lenses. And in our microscopes, there's three of them. Low, medium, and high power. And you could switch them from power to power. <laughs> the part that you hold on to and rotate to go from low to medium to high power, that part is called the nose piece. And then there's this, on this microscope in the, in the diagram, it's just straight up and down. On the microscopes that we use, it's sort of um, at an angle. It just makes it easier to see rather than leaning over the top. This part here that light travels through to go to the eyepiece, that's called the body tube.
down here, on our microscopes is a light. Ours are, um, work on cordless uh, batteries, and so we charge them, and then you don't have to like plug it in. You can take it to your desk to work on it. So that's called the light source. Now in this microscope, in the drawing, it's not an actual light. What is this showing? It's a mirror. That's a mirror. Like, Older that's microscopes used to have a mirror here. You'd shine a light at the mirror, and it would reflect it up through the rest of the microscope. We don't have any of those types of microscopes. Ours all have a built-in light source. This flat part where you put your slides to view is called the stage. Older microscopes had two clips that hold the slide on the stage. They were called stage clips. Our microscopes work a little differently. We have something called a mechanical stage. It has this spring-loaded clamp that you just push on and then it clamps down holding the slide in place. So ours are a little bit different from those. Below the stage is a dial that you could turn. The bottom has several holes of different sizes. What do you think that controls? The amount of light coming through. So if it's too bright, you could change this to make it darker or vice versa. It's called the diaphragm. The part you like hold on to and carry your microscope around that supports it, this is called the arm, and the bottom is called the base. And then there are two important knobs. Now, on this microscope, they're separate. There's a larger knob and a smaller knob. These knobs move the stage up and down. And what that does is it makes your image in focus. So sometimes you'll look through the microscope, it may be blurry. By, by turning these knobs, it's called the course adjustment, is the one that quickly moves it a lot and brings it into focus. The other one, the smaller one, moves it a smaller amount to kind of fine tune your image. That's called the fine adjustment. And so on the microscope and the image, there are two separate knobs. On these, hold on one sec. On these microscopes, they're built in. So the wider part is the coarse adjustment, and then the smaller part of the knob is the fine adjustment. So tomorrow we'll actually get some experience using these microscopes, looking at some different slides, and then we have a couple labs to do using these. You're going to form or